Hi, I'm Claire Ridgway, author of several Tudor history books. Now, in this first part of This Week in Tudor History, for the week beginning the 22nd of February, I'm going to talk about a translator killed by a broken leg, the lavish funeral of Elizabeth of York, and an earl who rose in the reigns of Elizabeth I and James I, but who was implicated in a murder in his final days. On the 22nd of February 1571, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, translator John Berry died. Berry, who was about 35 years old at his death, had suffered a fall from his horse six months earlier and had broken his leg, a serious injury in those days, and one which led to his death. Berry was survived by his wife Elizabeth Stafford, to whom he'd been married for seven years, and also their young son Thomas. Berry, the son of a London draper and merchant, is known for his 1559 work, The Godly Advertisement or Good Counsel of the famous orator Isocrates, an English translation of Isocrates' Greek speech, Ad Demonicum. And on to the 23rd of February. On the 23rd of February, 1503, in the reign of King Henry VII, Elizabeth of York, Queen Consort of Henry VII and mother of Henry VIII, was laid to rest at Westminster Abbey. Elizabeth had died on her 37th birthday on the 11th of February, nine days after giving birth at the Tower of London. In the last medieval queen's English queenship, 1445 to 1503, J. L. Lanesmith writes of how at least £3,000 was spent on Elizabeth's funeral, compared to the £600 spent on that of Arthur, Prince of Wales, the previous year, and that the whole process was rich with references to the queen's coronation. Following 10 days of lying in state at the Tower, the Queen's remains were conveyed to Westminster Abbey using the very same route that was used in coronation ceremonies. Her coffin, topped with an effigy of Elizabeth wearing her robes of estate and crown and holding her scepter, was placed on cushions of black velvet and blue cloth of gold in a carriage. The carriage was escorted by knights bearing banners displaying the royal arms and images of saints and the parents of the King and Queen and the procession was led by 200 poor people bearing torches, followed by members of the royal household, clerics and the mayor of London. Behind the carriage bearing Elizabeth's coffin were noble women, other officers of the City of London and more members of the royal household. When the procession reached Westminster Abbey, the coffin was placed on a hearse decorated with black cloth of gold emblazoned with the Queen's motto, humble and reverent, and royal emblems. The coffin then lay in state overnight with watchers and torchbearers while a supper was held in Elizabeth's chamber, presided over by her sister Catherine of York. On the 23rd of February, Elizabeth's funeral took place with her sister Catherine acting as chief mourner. 1,000 candles burnt around her coffin with 273 tapers burning above black cloths that hung from the roof of the abbey. Two masses and then a requiem mass were said before the ladies departed and the burial took place. The Bishop of London blessed the grave, the effigy was removed from the coffin and then the coffin was lowered into the grave. The Queen's officers then broke their staffs of office and threw them into the grave, symbolising the end of their service to the Queen. The grave in which Elizabeth was buried in 1503 was in a side chapel. She was later moved to her present resting place in a vault in Henry VII's Lady Chapel. Her husband joined her after his death in 1509. Their splendid tomb features gilt bronze effigies of the couple depicting them in prayer. Here is a description of their tomb from the Westminster Abbey website. 
The black marble tomb base is adorned with six medallions in copper gilt representing the Virgin Mary and Henry's patron saints Michael, George, Anthony, Christopher, Anne, Edward the Confessor, Vincent, Barbara, Mary Magdalene, John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. At either end are coats of arms supported by cherubs. The gilt bronze recumbent effigies can be seen through the fine grill which surrounds the monument. Seated angels balance on the carved frieze at each corner of the tomb, supporting coats of arms. They once held penance in their hands. I've been lucky enough to see this tomb and it really is beautiful. Elizabeth's tomb inscription reads, Here lies Queen Elizabeth, daughter of the former King Edward IV, sister of the formerly appointed King Edward V, once the wife of King Henry VII and the renowned mother of Henry VIII. She met her day of death in the Tower of London on the 11th day of February in the year of our Lord, 1502, having fulfilled the age of 37 years. Now that inscription dates her death to 1502, because Elizabeth died before Lady Day, the 25th of March, which was when the new calendar year began in those times. The effigy used in the procession and her funeral still exists and is in the collection of Westminster Abbey, along with that of her husband. And on to the 24th of February. On the 24th of February, 1540, in the reign of King Henry VIII, Courtier, author and administrator Henry Howard, Earl of Northampton, was born at Shotsham in Norfolk. Northampton was the second son of courtier and poet Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, and his wife, Lady Frances de Vere. Let me give you a few facts about this Tudor Earl. In 1548, following the execution of his father for alleged treason in 1547, eight-year-old Northampton was put into the care of his aunt, Mary Howard, Duchess of Richmond, who appointed Protestant John Fox, the famous martyrologist, and scholar Hadrianus Junius to educate him and his brothers. Between 1553 and 1558, the teenage Northampton served the Catholic John White, Bishop of Lincoln, as a page. In 1559, following the accession of Elizabeth I, he was restored in blood and his father's attainder reversed. The Queen paid for him to attend King's College, Cambridge, to study classics. He went on to study at Trinity Hall and also did a master's at Oxford. Although his father was of the reformed faith and he'd been tutored by John Fox, Northampton seems to have been influenced by his time with Bishop White and was of the Catholic persuasion. In Elizabeth I's reign, he went through periods of disfavour due to his links with Catholics. He was arrested in 1571 due to his brother Thomas Howard, fourth Duke of Norfolk's involvement in plots against the Queen and Norfolk's interest in marrying Mary, Queen of Scots. And Northampton was actually imprisoned five times. However, he rose in favour in the late 1590s due to his friendship with the Earl of Essex. Fortunately for Northampton, by the Earl's revolt in 1601, he'd distanced himself from Essex and was allied with the Cecil faction at court. In Elizabeth I's last two years, Northampton acted as messenger for Robert Cecil, taking letters to King James VI of Scotland, thus securing the King's favour for himself and Cecil. When the Scots King heard of Elizabeth's death, he sent Northampton a jewel as a gift. Northampton went on to serve King James I as a privy councillor, constable of Dover Castle, Lord Warden of the Sink Ports and Lord Privy Seal. He was created Baron of Marnhall, Dorset and Earl of Northampton in 1604. In 1605, Northampton was one of the King's councillors to whom Lord Monteagle took the anonymous letter warning of the gunpowder plot and Northampton made a speech at the trial of the conspirators in January 1606. He reached the zenith of his career under King James I, being the most influential Privy Councillor by 1613, thanks to his good relationship with Sir Robert Carr, 
who was close to the king. However, this friendship with Carr led to Northampton's involvement in the Overbury case. Sir Thomas Overbury, a good friend and previous mentor of Carr, opposed the match of Carr and Northampton's married niece, Frances, who was seeking a divorce. Overbury tried to persuade Carr out of the relationship. So Northampton conspired against Overbury, who was eventually imprisoned in the Tower of London. Overbury was poisoned to death in the Tower in September 1613, and Carr married Frances. The couple were found guilty of his murder in 1616 and sentenced to death. They weren't put to death, though. They were imprisoned, but then released in 1622. Northampton escaped punishment because he died on the 16th of June 1614 at his home in Charing Cross. Northampton never married. As well as being a courtier and administrator, Northampton was an author. His works included the 1569 Treatise of Natural and Moral Philosophy, the 1583 A Defensative Against the Poison of Supposed Prophecies, a translation of Charles V's Last Advice to Philip II, devotional writings, his A Dutiful Defence of the Lawful Regiment of Women, which was a reply to John Knox's criticism of female rulers, and his 1606, The True and Perfect Relation of the Whole Proceedings Against the Late Most Barbarous Traitors, Garnet, a Jesuit and his Confederates, and that was about the gunpowder plotters. Later this week, in part two, I'll be introducing you to a literary patron and her husband, a clergyman who ended up dying on a voyage far from home and being buried at sea, and a famous peacemaking reformer whose pragmatic approach failed to heal rifts and please people. Oh, and he ended up being dug up and posthumously tried for heresy and burnt. Wow. Please don't miss that. You can subscribe by clicking round about there. You can hit the bell to be notified as these videos go live. And please do consider giving me a like and you can leave a comment if you wish. I'll see you very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.